understanding heart conditions. And we have Professor um, Ian, who is going, who is a GP in his own right, and is going to be hosting these seminars, which I think will take place every month for the next five months. And in each seminar, apart from our host, we will also have a local personality who will also participate and therefore it will make the events interactive. And we hope that we will have participation from as many men as possible, but also, of course, uh, from women, so that, as I understand it, women do drag men to visit you, Chris, at the, at the primary care centre. And another interesting statistic that I also read, and I think it was the Director of Public Health that advised me, that unmarried men <coughs> tend to die sooner than married women. So that we tend to do rather well if we're married, but quite terribly if we're not married. And you can take anything that you like from that statistic, including the truth, which is that we're quite poor on our own. Right, so without further ado, thank you again very much for coming. And I introduce you to your host for the evening, Professor Ian Banks, I think. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a bit of fun tonight, okay? So, listen, first of all, relax, okay? Uh, we will not be doing any examinations in here, which lifts your voice up a couple of octaves. Uh, we will not be doing anything uh, horrible to you, um, but what we will be doing is hoping that you'll join in in terms of the discussion that we're, go that we're going to have. Now, before I do that, I want to do one thing. I want to thank Chris and I want to thank uh, Ian. Where's Ian, Pete? There, okay. Ian Pete, just, just need to tell you this, right? Ian Pete not only comes from Liverpool, he comes from the same street in Liverpool that I, that I came from, and he shares the same name, Ian. Isn't that an amazing coincidence? But I'll tell you the one thing I haven't got. He was recently bestowed the biggest, highest honour that the Royal College of Nurses in, in London can bestow upon its membership, the Fellowship of the Royal College of Nursing. Show your appreciation for what we've got. Isn't that brilliant? Isn't that absolutely brilliant? Congratulations. So I'm so delighted. I'm, I'm going to bask in his reflected glory. Anyway, we are going to have a bit of fun, but we're also going to learn an awful lot here today. We're not going to teach you all about health, and we're not going to patronise you, and we're not going to you know, tell you off, and we're not going to say you're stupid, you know. I mean, just because you've got a Y chromosome and a prostate does not automatically mean you're daft, you know. So we are going to assume that, um, uh, that you are here to, to, to debate and discuss, and then see what we get out the other end of it in terms of what can you do about your own health. In other words, how do you put yourself in the driver's seat? How do, you, how do you take control over your own destiny, you know, kind of thing. And I notice there's some lads here about my age, okay, so I'm 67. Do you know what the definition of uh, male, male middle age is? Does anybody know the definition of male middle age? It's when your prostate's bigger than your brain, okay? That's the that's definition of male middle age, okay? So um, that's me, you know, so if you see me rush off, I'm off to the toilet, okay? So you won't, you won't have to guess. Now, we're also going to talk about um, MOT testing. What does MOT stand for? Have we got any engineers here? Have we got any mechanics? No? What does MOT stand for? Does anybody know? Anybody? No, it stands for man only test. That's what it stands for, okay? So that's what we're going to be talking about. Man only tests, where we actually just look at the man alone. But should you be doing that? Because you can't separate men's health and women's health. As you heard, it's inextricably linked to two. But tonight we're going to concentrate on, on, on men's health. And you notice how many women we've got here. You always see that, incidentally. Whenever you talk about men's health, you always see a lot of women you know, in there as well. But we're going to see if we can get men to take more interest in, in, in their own health. And, and as, as you, I've already heard, there is a difference in life expectancy. In fact, in every country in the world, except for Tonga, and I had to look it up on the map to find out where it was, actually. Every country in the world, except for Tonga, women live longer than do men. Isn't that amazing? Every country in the world. Now, there can be three basic reasons for this, three theories, if you like. The first one is that it depends uh, on where the man lives, on social class, on his, on his use of services. Coming in, coming in, you're very welcome. You haven't missed anything yet, come on. Um, so it all depends on that. In other words, the environment, how, how much money you know, they earn, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so, so. 
The other theory is, is that it depends on genetics. In other words, if you're born a man, you're just pre-programmed, like sort of like a Mission Impossible tape, you know, that when you, when you reach the age of 55, you will drop dead, you know, because you're a man. A man's got to do what a man's got to do, that's drop dead early, kind of thing, you see, okay, so it's genetic. So there's nothing we can do about it, so we may as well all go home now, kind of thing. Okay, that's, the, that's the second one. And there's the third one, which is actually the most attractive and probably the most reasonable explanation, and that is that women kill men. Now, attractive as that theory is, it's not true because of what you just heard. Married men live longer than unmarried men, but unmarried women live less, uh, live longer than do married women. So, if anything, men make women ill. That's that's my wife, my wife believes in that believes in that theory enormously. So, we are going to go on that basis that there is something you can do about it. So, it's not just it's not just fate. It's not that you know you're not, not pre-programmed. You're not it's not genetic. There's something else, and, and in my opinion, what the something else is in terms of what makes this difference is the way we're brought up. I think men are basically brought up in a way where you're taught not to actually complain about your health and, and worry about your health and so on. To so put on a you know a strong you know masculine sort of you know persona about yourself, you know macho kind of thing. I think we're brainwashed into that, absolutely brainwashed in, into, into thinking that way. And that men shouldn't cry, for instance, you know, you, you, you think about that, the implications of that, what it means is, you know, not to show your emotions, you know, this kind of, this kind of thing. And I think we're breaking out of that. And what I really want to get over tonight is, is that it's, it, is, it is not good enough just blaming men. We've got to look at the way that we're educated men. We've got to look at the way we bring men up as boys to become men. In, in the school that my two lads went to, when, when they reach, um, you know, um, puberty kind of thing, they, they weren't taught anything about it. They were just told to go and play football kind of thing. But the two girls, they were taught about puberty. They were taught what was going to happen to them and that kind of thing. And then they could express themselves. But the lads, they didn't get anything at all in terms of, 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 of any insight about what's going to happen to them. And when you think about when you go through something like that, you know, your hair starts going a bit strange and, you know, your voice starts to lower, you know, all kind of things and hormones start to, you know, going through. So, so, so I think we need to look at the way we're doing it. And this is going to be part of it tonight, because what we're going to do tonight is, and thank you for coming to this, and we're, and we're going to run a series of these. What we're really doing is, is, is to see can we, can we, how can we get men to talk to other men and to their partners about using services. <coughs> So I'm going to split you up, not physically, I'm going to split you up into groups, okay? Because in the audience, you've got some experts, you've got people who are experts, okay? And they know what they're talking about. Come on in. Oh, sorry, I thought you were there. <laughs> I was going to ask you for your ticket. Um, so we've got experts in the, in the room who I'm going to ask specific questions of. And they, they know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. So we've got them. And then we've got women okay we've got women in the audience now whether you're an expert or not okay you're still still a woman see what i'm getting at so so you you are the women group okay and then we've got typical men and and the people who are not women and who are not the experts are typical men okay so let's do an experiment now we'll try and see can you get yourself sorted out into that group okay so could we please have the health professionals the healthcare professionals please show that show that show their hands okay okay put your hands up healthcare professionals okay Good, all right, mainly over this area, some over this area, okay. Now, women, put your hands up, please. Good, okay, that's very good. Now, typical men, put up your hands if you've got an erection at the moment. <laughs> very good. Oh, well done, well done, you're well done. So, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I'll have a chat with you later. <laughs> so, so, okay, so we've got typical men, we've got women, and we've got healthcare professionals. That's a good mix. So hopefully we'll be able to get, a, get to, to, to grasp with some of the subjects. Now I thought what we'd start off with is, um, is a, a nice easy topic to talk about. A lot of men will you know, find difficulty talking about, and that is erectile dysfunction. Okay? It's going to talk about erectile dysfunction, we're going to talk about impotence, it used to be called impotence. And the reason why we're going to talk about this is because of what, is, what lies behind the story. Okay? Now, those of you who know all these things and have never been near this kind of experience, you know that erectile dysfunction uh, will not kill you. Okay? You might wish you were dead, and, and whoever you're with might wish you were dead, but actually erectile dysfunction will not kill you. Okay? But some of the medical conditions which cause erectile dys dysfunction can. 
And they include diabetes, they include dyslipidemia, which means with the fats in your blood have got, you know, are the wrong sort of mix, if you like. And so it clogs up the arteries. And hypertension, high blood pressure, they're the three. Now, all of those are conditions, if not diagnosed, if not diagnosed early, will cause problems. Now, I want to, who's our, who is our um, cardiac nurse I was chatting to? Who was, who was it? And we dealt with diabetes. Who was that? Yourself. Yourself. Yes. Now, could you just tell me, what is the connection? Why is it that erectile dysfunction is linked to cardiovascular disease? Could you just, in a, in a sense, like, tell me why? Um, thanks for putting me in the spot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan Edwards, diabetes nurse, uh, work in primary care. And uh, in answer to Ian's question, um, men who suffer problems with erection, usually there is a problem with the small blood vessels. And if you have problems with your small blood vessels, that means that eventually your big blood vessels are going to be damaged and that will give you problems with your heart and maybe you could even get a stroke. Absolutely. Exactly. You, you've summed it up beautifully for me. That's the kind of answer I like. Now, that is the, that is the answer. Do you know, I'm, just going to, I'm just going to repeat it, okay, because it, 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 it actually is very, very simple. And yet, you wouldn't believe how many doctors don't get this message, don't understand it. I'm serious. I'm absolutely serious. It is the little blood vessels that in, the, in, in the penis which get blocked up. Okay, that's what is causing the problem. But they're exactly the same kind of blood vessels in what's in your heart and what's in going up to going up to your going up to your brain. But the ones in your heart are much bigger. So the effect isn't seen until later. Now if you're driving a car, you, typical men, okay, typical men, shows hands, typical men, right? You're driving a car, you're driving a car, and the blue light comes on on the on, on the dashboard, okay? Right? In other words, there's something going on with the oil. Do you keep driving, carrying on for another 20,000 miles, or do you put some oil into the engine? Why? What would you do? Obviously, I would put uh, oil, into, oil into, the, into the engine as soon as I can. What would happen to the engine if you didn't put the oil in? It would probably uh, clog up and, um, you know, if not, uh, it overheat okay. and destroy it. Okay. Right, yeah. Does anybody know which bit of the engine will tend to break first? Do you know what the first thing is? Not really, no. Don't worry, don't worry. Because it's the big ends. The big ends go first, okay? That's, and then it's when you hear the big ends knocking. That is what happens. So if you think about the big end in a man, okay? His big end actually is the first bit to go if you ignore the blue light on your dashboard when it comes to your body. That is basically what we're saying. Your body will give you warning over these kind of things and you ignore them at your peril because your big ends are gonna go if you don't do something about it. So take your big end to the doctor, take your big end to the pharmacist and get some advice or whatever about it and actually get it sorted out. Now, one of the causes of this is hypertension, okay? Now, high blood pressure, what happens in high blood pressure? Do people get symptoms with high blood pressure? Does a man know when he's got high blood pressure? Who's a cardiovascular nurse? Well, I tell you, like, can I ask a pharmacist? Can I ask a pharmacist? Because we tend not to use... Just say who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Daniel, and I'm a pharmacist. Please, thank you. And tell me now, do men get symptoms of, of high blood pressure? I think everybody gets them when you've got high blood pressure. It's just whether they act upon them or not. Okay. I think, I don't know. The, the men that come in with the symptoms is because their wives are pushing well, why, why, why it. Is it <laughs> why is it called a silent well, Because most of the symptoms can probably be attributed to other things. And you tend to dig, put your head in a hole and ignore them and let it go. That'll do it. Thanks very much. Yeah, in, in fact, most men will have no idea that they've got high blood pressure. There is no real sign that comes to the man and warns them that you've got high blood pressure until it's really, really been there for a long time. So you get no warning with high blood pressure. So what can you do to prevent getting a stroke from high blood pressure, <laughs> to prevent getting erectile dysfunction, can prevent all these things, okay, what can you do? A simple test that can be done by themselves. Who have we got? Cardiovascular? What simple, what would you do? What can men do about that? How are they gonna find out? 
Hello, my name is Suzanne Romero and I work as a nursing assistant in primary care. Um, I suppose that the first point of call should be to attend a GP or even one of the practice nurses. That's most of the cases where the patients uh, attend uh, telling us that they've got some symptom of tension headaches or slightly blurred vision or something which is gen they feel generally unwell but, but they cannot pinpoint exactly what is going on with them so basically that's when we screen them that's when we do the blood pressure and that's when we find out that they do have um you know some element of high blood pressure and that's where we then engage with the patients a screening program for them okay so you basically these guys how do you get hold of these guys how do you how do you get them to come to see you we try to promote um many patients who attend or walk in or ask for advice we try to promote for them to come and have a, like a, a form of screening or to attend to their gp or you know um it's, it's a matter it's more like um like a um sort of fishing a, a, you know taking a fish up the sea and sort of fishing them out when you see that there's something not really quite well with the patients normally patients unless they don't have a symptom they will not come to seek advice so the answer so okay here's typical man here's the first message for you tonight then is that with the likes of high blood pressure, basically you get no warning. Basically there's no blue light can give you warning about the high blood pressure. The only thing you, where you can do anything about it is, is to get a regular check. Get a blood pressure check. But you don't have to go to see the doctor. Actually pharmacists are already doing um, blood, blood pressure checks as well. You can do it yourself. And actually doing it yourself is actually better, believe it or not. Because you get a thing called the white coat effect. And that is as you're sitting in the waiting room for seven hours waiting to see your GP or maybe, maybe not as long as that, <laughs> reading all the women's magazines. Have you noticed there's no men's magazines in the, in the waiting room? Have you ever noticed that? It's all home and garden or fashion or whatever. There's nothing. You don't get the beano. You know, but anyway, it's not in there. You know? so, so, so do it yourself. Check your own blood pressure. It costs 10 quid. A machine costs 10 quid to check your blood pressure. If you go to the pharmacy, he'll sell you one. He'll sell you one. 10 quid. That's, that's buggered you up, hasn't it? Now he's got to sell it for 10 quid. Now. <laughs> 10 quid. You can do that. And you get change out of the 10 quid, right? So, but test it yourself. And that means you don't get the white coat effect. You don't get your blood pressure going up because you're scared, because you're worried about seeing the doctor and asking them, oh, you know, what's going on kind of thing. You're not sitting in the waiting room worrying and worrying. It's like your blood pressure going up and up and up. Just do it yourself. And the beauty of doing that is, is that once you've got a baseline, once you know what your blood pressure is when you're relaxed and everything's all right, you're going okay, now you can compare it to a bit later on. If you do it now, no, I don't do it every week, you know, you can do it every month, it's more than enough. But you do it another month's time. If suddenly you see your blood pressure rising and going up steadily, that's when you can, start, you can go and see the doctor and say, I'm finding my blood pressure starting to rise. What can I do about this kind of thing? Okay, so you're in the driving seat. You can actually check your own, your own blood pressure. There's no reason why you can't do that. It's dead, dead simple. I tested those blood pressure machines out myself against one that doctors use. They were very accurate, actually. I was amazed how accurate they were. And they're better because you, you're doing it yourself. Okay. The other thing is, of course, is, is how do you avoid it all in the first place of getting the high blood pressure, the dyslipidemia, in other words, your fat's all going wrong. Is there any way, in terms of lifestyle, of avoiding this happening in the first place? Who's our lifestyle nurse? We've got a lifestyle, we've got a lifestyle nurse in somewhere here who's dead keen. It's got here, she's dead keen on changing lifestyle. It says here, who's that? Susan Edwards. Was it Susan? No? <laughs> Wasn't Susan. Was it Adrian? No, he's a bowel cancer straight go down. Right, well, who, who's, a, who's this alive? It's you, of course it was you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Parker. I'm a diabetes specialist nurse and I work at the hospital. Um, I am looking after the diabetes patients, but I've got a vested interest in stopping people getting diabetes and trying to pre prevent it. And lifestyle measures are really uh, important. Keeping to a good weight and keeping active and not smoking or stopping smoking are the best ways of preventing blood pressure, cardiac problems and diabetes. Good, okay, well thank you for that. But
It's easy to say, isn't it? It's very, very easy. It's easy to say, and it's, it can be hard to do. But the one thing what we've found is, is that giving up smoking, and losing weight in particular, men can do this really well. And that is if they buddy up with their mates. Now the great thing about men is, in terms of putting on weight is, and incidentally, I'll tell you a story. I used to be 18 stone. I can't feel like this. And I lost weight. And I did a, a, a wireless interview with you know, Jeremy Kyle. Have you ever heard of Jeremy Kyle? Right, on BBC. Yeah. Anyway, I did a, a radio program with this lad, like Jeremy Kyle, and uh, all about weight, obesity, national obesity. And uh, I had a guy on with me called David Haslam. This is a live show on BBC Radio 2. <coughs> and uh, I sort of fallen asleep. I've been on duty. I was an A&E doctor. And I, I, I'd uh, started to fall asleep. I was on duty last night. And I heard David just suddenly say to Jeremy Kyle, and you know, Ian lost an enormous amount of weight himself, which I had, I'd lost eight stone, you know, kind of thing. So, so anyway, Jeremy Kyle said, is that right, Ian? How on earth did you manage to lose so much weight? And I said, I had a circumcision. And he looked at me, like this, <laughs> absolute silence, you know, and silence on a radio goes on forever. You know, like this, you know. And I could see in the control box, the producers looking at each other going, did he say that? Did he really say that? And when I got home, and then he went on to say, after a, after a huge gap, he went on to say, well, it's interesting, would you advise your patients to, you know, to do this? You know, well, not really. When I got home, my wife had heard the broadcast, and she said to me, she said, if you ever tell that story again, I'll give you a circumcision. She said. <laughs> I, I've never tested her on that one, so I'm not telling her that I actually told you all about this. But the point being, being, being about, about this is that men can lose weight in a way which women can't. Men tend to put the weight on around the gut and around your neck. That's, that's about all. That's about the only places that you put your weight on is around your neck. That's why the collar size gets bigger. And around your gut, that's why the belt size gets bigger. In women, you put weight on all over, but particularly on the bum and the, th and the, and the, and the thighs. So when women try to lose weight, it seems to take ages before anything's happening, because it's happening all over kind of thing. But when men start to lose weight, you see it straight away. You feel it in your trousers, you feel it in your belt straight away. Even after a week, you actually start to feel the effects of it. Now, if you buddy up with a mate on this, like say for smoking or, you know, or, or, or likes, likes of this, you can then start to do a bit of competition kind of thing on it, collaboration on it, and actually start to lose weight. What I would recommend, if anybody's thinking about doing this, is donate a notch. Donate a notch, okay? Off your belt. Lose a notch and get people to sponsor you for losing that, that notch off your belt and donate it to me. All right? <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. So that's the, that's the good news anyway about, um, about obesity and uh, about diabetes. Diabetes type 2 is actually preventable. It is preventable in many cases. And actually, we've found it is reversible. It, I, I, that happened to me. I was diabetic type 2. And when I lost all the weight very quickly, the diabetes went as well. It never come back. I'm, I'm still not diabetic. So the good news is out there. You can do something about not becoming diabetic. Now, obviously, if you're type 1 diabetes, that's different. There's a different. We're talking about a different animal altogether. But type 2, this is the one which comes on later in life, mainly, and is linked very much to being overweight. That can be prevented and, and certainly delayed even coming on, even if your mum and dad had, you know, had, had diabetes. Okay. Right, I'm going to move on now to, to a, another area now, and this is about the prostate, okay? So, so the prostate, the only screening that we do, and it's not really screening for the, for, for the, for the prostate, um, it's, it's a test. It's called the PSA test. Right? Now, the PSA test is prostate-specific antigen. What it is, is it, you test the blood for a protein which is secreted out of the, out of the prostate. Now, it, the, there should theoretically never be this protein in your bloodstream. It shouldn't be there, really, because it's, it's actually inside the prostate. So if it's leaking out, then it can tell you something, not least about the size of the prostate. It is not a test for cancer. People think it's a test for cancer, the PSA test. It's not. What it is a test for is the size of the prostate, because as it gets bigger, it leaches out this protein um, more. And if you're going to get this test done, don't go to the, to the doctor's surgery on a bike. Okay? If you go on a bike, it raises your, your, your PSA levels. 
don't go if you just had a bad flu or a co or a cold. It puts your your your, your, um, your, your PSA levels up. Okay, anything like inflammatory, anything you know that. Like an infection tends to put up the PS, the PSA. So go only when you get it tested, when you're feeling well, you haven't got anything going on, and you don't cycle in it. Okay, you walk there, go on the bus or whatever. Okay, so that's important. Now, why is it important to do it? It's important not just because it tells you something about your prostate. It gives you what we talked about before, a baseline. Okay, it gives you something you can compare with. So if you get it done at say the age of 50, it's not a bad age to get it checked. Just get it checked. It's very, very simple. Get it checked at 50. Now the doctor has got something they can refer to when you go back in two years' time or whatever. And if it's rising, that means there's something going on. And, the, and by the speed at which it's rising, tell the doctor whether or not you're going to need to go and get, get further tests test done. And one of the problems that we've got with the prostate is, is over-testing. It's, it's, this is one of the, the scarier sides of it. We, 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 people get scared about it, and so we get, get to see the doctor too much, and then the doctor gives up at an end, and it's oh, we're going to get you, you know, go see the doctor, and then, then you get biopsies, and so it goes on. No, the best way of doing this is get yourself a baseline. Now you know where you're starting from, and then after that, you get it checked on a, maybe one yearly, two yearly, whatever. You talk to your doctor, and then you see, and if it's staying nice and steady, that'll do it. It will rise as you get older. It will rise as you get older and it will go up and down, you know, a wee bit. But it's, if it does this kind of thing, that's when we need to get to it sorted out. And if you get it early, bingo, you can get it sorted out. So that's the prostate cancer. Now, typical men, I want to ask you a question, okay, about this. You know, from, uh, can I use you two? Because you're about my age. You're not. You're too young. You're, you're, you're about my age. Okay, now, when you were a lad, did you ever know what testicular cancer was? No. No. Did you ever talk about it? No. No. I didn't. I had no idea what this kind of cancer was. Did you know that men can get breast cancer? No. Most men don't know you can get breast cancer. Did you know that more men die from breast cancer than die from testicular cancer? No. Most people don't know that. And it's true. More men will die from breast cancer than die from testicular cancer. But well, how many men know that? How many men would examine themselves the way women would examine themselves to see whether or not they've got anything there? We don't. In fact, men actually tend not, I'll come into it, tend not to examine themselves. I, mean, I could have God Save the Queen tattooed on my back. I wouldn't know. I've never seen me back. My wife's seen me back, but I've never seen. Who, what men here, look at yourself in the mirror, you know, I don't. So examination of ourselves, we tend not to, not, not to, not to do these things. Do you want me to say, would you say who you are and where you're coming from? Uh, my name is Andrew. I just have a brief question about the term breast cancer. Why is it breast cancer if it's applied to men? Why is it? Why does it apply to men? No, the term breast cancer. Why is it applied as a, in a female as a female phrase to men? I don't have breasts. It's still not breasts, and it's still the same tissue. It's the same, same tissue. It's a good question. It's a good. No, it's a good question. It's not a stupid question. It's a good question. <laughs> Because, because that's the problem, is that men think about it that it is just women. That breast you know, means women, but men have got breasts. We've got we've got breasts. And in fact, when you, if you if you put on weight, your breasts actually grow. Men man boobs, like we call them, right? That's called gynecomastia. Is where the where the breast actually grows bigger on a man, and it looks very like a woman's type of type 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 of breast as well. Now, unfortunately, if that happens, then your risk goes up of breast cancer as well. Men can get breast cancer. I saw a guy with breast cancer. He was a truck driver in Belfast, and it was very advanced. I saw him in A and E, which means that he's had it for a long time. He's coming to A and E with it, you know. Anyway, he killed himself after two weeks, not because it was cancer, because it was breast cancer. That's why he did because he, he was so embarrassed. And his family actually asked not to put breast cancer on the certificate. To put on chest wall cancer, we've got put on the certificate in the end. So we probably even more men than we than we think if the if the change in the you know what's what the cause was and so on. Okay, right. So that's a really good point, that. Thank you, because I'm going to use that in the future. Because you're absolutely right. Men do think about breasts as being as being doctors don't and and healthcare professionals don't, but men do. They think about breasts as being women, and that's part part of the part of part of the problem. Have you ever come across this, this anomaly? Have you, you guys ever come across this anomaly where, where men are thinking that it's, a, you know, it's a, only a woman's condition? I never refer to my chest 
yeah. No, it's a very, very good point. Very, very good point. Yes, sir. No, I just want to ask. Well, use the microphone. I just want to ask whether there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions Absolutely. later on. Just come in now. As you can. You can now, now. Yes. why do we do it now? I have two questions. One of them is, you know, um, if I smoke one cigarette a day and say five over the weekend, uh, does that constitute a measurable risk to health? Perfect. Obviously not smoking at all. Perfect. It's better. The other, the other question, yes, one at a time, do okay. One, we'll do that one and then we'll come to the other one, okay? All right, smoking. Right, let, let, I'll, I'll do part of that. And have we got any, any of the nurses? Have Actually, you got any? I, I left something out, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I meant to mention that I read some time ago in a medical column in a local paper that um, smoking up to five cigarettes a day, the lungs clear themselves. I don't know whether anyone is in a position to say whether that is true or not. Okay. Right, I think there's an awful lot of myths about cigarette smoking. And, and first of all, can I say, in Gibraltar, you have the highest level of cigarette smoking in all of the countries associated with the UK, and that includes Jersey and Guernsey and so on. You have the highest rate of, of, of cigarette smoking, both women and men. It's not, not just men, it's women and men. And it's right across the board. It's right across the board on this. So you do. Now, I think the, 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 the reason is pretty bloody obvious. I mean, you walk down the high street and the, the bus cigarettes there, and you're giving them away. You know, I mean, well, just take them away. They take up the room. You take them. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the reason, because they're so cheap. So that's, that's basically what it's all about. So your question is, is that which one? Well, the answer to this is actually we don't really know what triggers it, because people could smoke 100 cigarettes a day and, and apparently not seem to have any, any ill effect. But when you look at a whole population, and you look at that, you can see that the number of cigarettes smoked actually it, it follows the path in terms of increasing risk from things like lung cancer, but not just lung cancer, it actually causes a whole battery of other conditions, cardiovascular um, and problems you know, for the heart, um, possibility of stroke, uh, all of these things are all, all part of the cigarette smoking and, 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 and chronic chest um, conditions um, as well that, that can, like thing called emphysemia, um, all linked to, to, cig to cigarette smoking. But probably the worst thing about it is, and, and, you, and, and so therefore in terms of your the answer to your question is, is that, is that it, it really, the only answer with cigarette smoking is just to stop full stop, not, not to try and say, oh, well, if I just take, you know, it's a bit like drinking, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you know, you, oh, we won't hurt if we only drink two bottles a day kind of thing. You know, you, you've got to stop. You know, you've just got to stop it. And, and as I say, if you buddy up with another guy, to do that, it's a lot easier if, you, if your mates do it with you, you know, in the workplace or, you know, at home or whatever. But the, the worst thing aspect of it is, and you're my age, it's not you in a sense that matters. It's the children who are next to you who are smoking because you're smoking. And then they see you smoking and they love you, you know, and they think, well, you know, if, if, if granddad does it, it can't be that bad, you know, look how, look how old he is, you know, you know. So we pass it on. And I think that's the important thing when you get to our age. It's not just ourselves, it's the kids who are looking at us smoking, you know, I think that's, that's the point. But your question's a good one, because it's one of those you get asked all the time by people, if I just smoke five, do you think it'll be all right, you know? I think it's not that, it's, it's other people, kids watching you, I think is what, what we've got to do, you know? Okay, any other questions? Let's see, is there any more? Yeah, you've got one more. Yes, no problem, no problem. I'm sorry, I don't want to take over. No, the other question which has come up to, um, recently, I have been taking uh, decaffeinated uh, coffee for a very long time, right. okay. normally about two, uh, two a day. And the uh, doctor advised my wife when I was president that uh, decaffeinated coffee contains ingredients which are worse than the caffeine in the normal coffee. And uh, the other thing is, um, this, uh, this doctor said that I should not have more than one or two coffees a week. That to me seems a bit of an exaggeration. Can anyone put me wise on that one? There was a, a case there just recently, I don't know if you saw it, of a, of a young man in um, America who died from drinking uh, too much um, caffeine-containing drinks, you know, the, the, the uh, energy drinks. 
and coffee, and he died. He, he killed him. Really. He got a, his heart became irregular, and then he died. But your question in terms of decapitation, I don't know the answer to that. Actually, does anybody know the answer to that? Because, because the the single biggest factor here is the caffeine. Now I'm totally deaf. You know, you've probably noticed this machine stuck on the side of me, on my head. Here. But I'm totally deaf. I mean, just the kind of doctor you need, by the way. Half blind and deaf. You know, if you see me coming towards you, just run. You know, don't, don't, don't walk. Just run. You know? But but. It, it, when I drink um, coffee, I get the most amazing tinnitus, even though I'm deaf. Isn't that weird? So if I drink a cup of coffee, I get this noise in my head, like as if somebody's screaming at the very, very top of the voice. So I tend to avoid coffee, as you can imagine. So uh, the answer to your question is, I don't know. But I'll tell you one way of finding out, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Google it. Put it into Google. And it, it's amazing. And they tested Google against doctors, and they found out that Google actually could tell you, you know, if you're going to have a heart attack or not, better than the doctor um, could. I would go to see the Google if I were you. Go back slightly to uh, something we yeah. talked about, which is uh, questions about caffeine, <coughs> about uh, smoking, yeah. uh, and, and uh, this is probably not just for men, this is for men and women. One of the difficulties no we deal with a lot is, 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 no, no, it's, it's good, it's right, because I'm kind of comfortable in this phase is that um, we have conflicting conflicting advice. So the point being that one minute you're thinking decaffeinated coffee is good, and the next minute you think decaffeinated coffee is bad. One minute you're thinking that uh, butter is good, then it's bad. Then margarine is good, then it's bad. And this is probably a consistent thing for screening with men and women. And, and uh, half of the problem, I suspect, with some of the resistance when it comes to actually coming for screening and coming for health advice, you don't really know uh, what the what the right advice is, what you should be doing at home. And when you when you do get that advice, often it's very dictatorial. You're told, don't eat butter because the cholesterol is bad for you. And there's this natural psychology around it, which is very much, uh, you know, I don't like being told what to do. So there is that, you'll, you'll go the other way sometimes. And that may very well be, you know, one of the things we see with smoking. Everybody knows it's bad for, you know, there's, there's not a single person on the planet that doesn't realise that smoking is bad for you, but people consistently do smoke despite that. So there's that kind of psychology behind it, and that almost that resistance or rebellion that goes with it. Yeah. I think I think uh, your point is very well taken, I, I, and, I, and I think actually the medical profession um, and public health actually has something to answer for in terms of communication. <laughs> Um, um, I'm not just saying just about G Gibraltar, I'm talking about it generally, but to keep giving people you know, contradictory messages about what is good and what is bad. In the end, people just don't believe it anymore, and so it's not surprising that they, they don't uh, stick to, you know, to a regime that you, that you would say. But I can, you can't blame people. I think this is, this is what I'm trying to get across tonight is, is that it's not individuals' fault. You know, this, this, is, this is the thing. When you scratch the surface, you find out there's usually a good reason why somebody is smoking or is drinking too much and, you know, and so on. And that's part of, of, of what, what we're going to be looking at in the next, because we're going to be wrapping up um, soon. How much, how much? Yeah, we're going to be wrapping up, uh, wrapping up soon. But, but that's what we're going to be doing in the rest of, the, of these talks. We've sort of introduced now this idea of, 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 of you taking control of your, of, of your lives by, by whatever means. And what I would like very much to do is when we take it on into the other areas to then start to, 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 to look at what can you do, what, what, but not, not what can your doctor do, what can you do, and then what is actually a way of preventing some of, some of these things in the, in, in the first place. And that's what we're going to do when we look at things like cancer and we look at these other things. These are not written in stone. There's nothing inevitable about these things. They can, they can be done. Yes, please. Yeah, my name's Guillermo Mauro. I'm um, just your normal Joe Blogs. Um, yeah, what I wanted to ask before you wrap up and, and finish the session is, is there such a thing as an MOT clinic for men actually available through the GHA? I know that, uh, well, I understand that for women there are, that once they, they get to a certain age or whatever, they're asked to come in for, on a yearly basis or something like that, and a whole array of checks are done on them. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's, it's not available for men. Uh, I personally have had my PSA done on a couple of occasions. I started because I used to do a lot of cycling, had slight problems, but fortunately there was nothing there. But um, having said that, you know, unless somebody has a problem, they won't do, they won't necessarily go and do these checks. Absolutely. If it's available as an MOT, as you were yeah. in your analogy before with the car engine, 
if you go and do your, your service maintenance on a yearly basis, hopefully a lot of these things will be abided. It just so happens, sat behind you, happens to be an expert. Pass her the microphone. In terms of man clinics, tell us all about your man clinics. No, I'm not an expert. My name is Marguerite Vassano. I'm a GP at the health centre. I run the Well Woman Clinics. Now, I'd like to say, I used to run a Well Man Clinic from about 20 years ago till about eight, 12 years ago. And the reason it folded up was it was a self-referral clinic and I found very quickly that the wrong men came. This is the problem. Self-referral, I used to get all the well men, the one who knew more about diet and exercise than I did. So I think, unless it's targeted, unless it's general awareness. I, I used to look across the street and there was this whole range of taxi rack. I'm sorry, there's taxi men here. The taxi rack. A lot of overweight men, sedentary jobs, smoked heavily. Those were the ones I wanted in the well man clinic, not the well men. And yes, we are going to start a well, a, a well man clinic very soon. Uh, Dr. Rowell will know more about when than I do. And I think if we raise public awareness, we will get more of the general population, not the well men. Is that okay with you? Can I just um, add on to that as, as Joe Brook? I tried to speak it, Rob. Um, maybe part of the problem is because, with all due respect, I'm not trying to be sexist, so is that you're a woman? That's another. You know, men will not normally be so uh, open. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Open with other men is difficult. With a woman, you're right. probably you're right. more so. <coughs> right, Anybody else got a comment again? No, it's fine. I just um, made a comment. Even if you're well, you still have an entitlement to go to an MOT. It's not a, a precursor that you have to be sick to go there. Is, is that not the case? No, that, that's absolutely okay. right. um, By definition, it's a well-man clinic, so it's by definition. I mean, this is something that you do for, you do for again, for things like the baselines, you know, to get your blood pressure checked, to get your PSA test. These are the kind of things that you can do at a well-man well -man clinic. You don't, obviously, you're not going with your leg hanging off. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, it's another, that's another job. But, but no, you're correct on this. But again, you see, the point being here is, is that the pharmacist is, is, is so well trained in terms of medicine and the use of medicine and so on, yet men hardly ever use them. And when we, when we ask men, why do you not go into the pharmacy, they say things like, well, it's all lipstick and no spanners. You know, it's true, isn't it? You think about it. I mean, you don't smell like diesel when you come out of a, a pharmacy, do you? You know, it's, it, it smells like perfume. It's a very, very female environment. And what we found is, is that, that actually men use the pharmacy nearly 20 times less than women do. And that when they do use the pharmacy, they tend not to ask the pharmacist a question. In other words, they're just not using the pharmacist as a resource of information, which they are, a huge resource. If I wanted information about a medicine, I wouldn't ask a doctor, I would ask a pharmacist. He got six years of training in pharmacology. I got six months training in pharmacology. Who would you rather ask about a drug, a medicine? Ask him, don't ask me. He knows more than I do. Use the pharmacist when it comes to, it comes to, to medicines. Quick comment, yeah? <coughs> I should have said so in my first question. My name is, my name is Ronnie Barabich. Um, a question similar to the question of um, the, caf the, the caffeinated coffee. Saccharin. I've been taking saccharin in lieu of uh, sugar for about 30 years. Uh, I've always heard that that is not good practice, that saccharin is no good. Can anyone uh, enlighten me on that one? I, I definitely wouldn't say uh, that I'm an expert on saccharin. All I would say is that, again, it comes back to my comments about conflicting evidence. Uh, if you are if you are moving into a, into a place where you're adding saccharin to your tea and coffee, why not give it up completely and go without sugar or saccharin? Saccharin ultimately is a chemical, so you're swapping sugar which is bad for you because it's sugar but pure for saccharin which is bad for you because it's a chemical and you must know it's a chemical because of the aftertaste when you've had it um, so and it takes three to four days for your palate to adjust if you go from say two sugars in your tea or coffee to one it takes three or four days and then you get used to it three or four days to the next one and so at the moment your palate is currently very used to saccharin but cut it down give it up
good answer. Does that answer your question? Good man. Thanks for the question. Yes, please, go ahead. I just wanted to um, add a little bit about it. There's a brilliant um, resource on Diabetes UK and if you're ever thinking what is the truth, there's a thing called what the papers say and the, they have position statements as well and their position statement at, at the moment is they pay independent researchers and there is no evidence that there's any danger in any saccharin and what they say is they'll carry on doing research anyway but the advice is buy a different brand each time you have buy one and then if there is an ever an implication of one brand you won't have always had that brand you'll have had a brand you know you'll have lots of different brands and you won't have been at risk um, but there's no evidence because there's lots of things on it, the internet where it said it's about ADHD and cancers and there's no evidence at all that any of that is true about them. Yeah. Well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said that because we, one of the problems that we have I think is actually convincing people that there is no evidence and they said oh there's no smoke without fire you know kind of thing and what happened in, in England was when the same, a similar thing happened over uh, vaccination with the triple vaccine for um, whoop and cough and, uh, and measles and so on and um, it, the paper that was published it was published in a medical journal and it was found out to be incorrect but the damage was done it was so so emotive that this could damage your children, that people stop vaccinating the, their children. And for the first time ever in my medical career, I actually saw cases of, a, of an inflammation of the brain, um, called an encephalitis, which is, comes from the measles that, that, that they have. Measles is not always a, you know, a, a minor illness. You know, it, it can be actually life-threatening in, ch in, in children. In fact, measles is the second biggest killer in the world of, of children. Measles, imagine, measles. So what happened was we had an epidemic of measles and I saw children with their brains damaged as a result of this. And this was simply because the public didn't believe the government when it said that there is no connection between the vaccination and these problems that, that this, this paper said. But isn't that tragic? I don't know whether it happened here. Did it happen here as well? A little bit, a little bit. Okay, we're coming to the end now, I'm afraid, because we have to go, have to go, there's a film going to be shown right now. I don't know what it is. It's not about sex. I don't know what it is. But I uh, <laughs> wish it was. Um, anyway, any other questions? Any other points from anybody? No. Can I just say, there's two people down here in America. I just want to ask you, 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 you two, your parents came from uh, Gibraltar? Your grandparents came from Gibraltar? Right. I want to thank you. My dad was stationed here during the war. And he got in, it was the Royal Navy. And his ship got sunk. And it was the Gibraltarians who went out and picked him up and he survived. Now, if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here now thanking you for, for doing that for, for my dad. But thank you to the Gibraltarians, because I, I'm, I'm glad I am here, actually, and thank you very much for looking after him. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the, uh, of the, of the evening. I hope you pick some up.